All right, so I think this is probably, as far as I know, the first talk that we've ever done here where people are talking about something that has nothing to do with money. Um, and so what I've kind of been looking at and working on for about the last four months is using the cryptographic primitives that make up Bitcoin as a design pattern for something completely different. Um, because I've, I, saw, I see a problem that Bitcoin, that needs a solution, and that Bitcoin is a really good, good, good for, Bitcoin as a concept, as a conceptual framework, as an engineering sort of diagram of what you need to build is a really powerful way of solving that problem. And so that problem is in the supply chain. So, <coughs> Bitcoin is an implementation or the sort of goals of Bitcoin is to implement these ideas, you know, a trustless cryptocurrency, a, a platform for various crypto anarchy ideas, and the world's most expensive time stamping system. Um, <laughs> but Bitcoin is also probably represents a massive breakthrough in these three ideas uh, for machine real readable identifiers and credentials, and I'll get into a little bit more about what I mean by that, for a verifiable directed acyclic graph. So I'm going to call them DAGs for the rest of the, um, and DAGs are a data structure that you start seeing that, you know, you see in lots of different places. You know, Git is a famous example of a directed acyclic graph data structure. Um, and my sort of hypothesis is, is that there are a lot of problems in the world that are actually shaped like directed acyclic graphs. Um, and also Bitcoin is a great platform for a system that can replicate data all over the world under significant duress, as long as it's not a lot of data. So this is Probably, this is the earliest photo I can get of one of the world's first machine-readable identifiers. Um, it's sort of been a driving factor in the development of computers, the computing industry, computer science, the deployment of machine-readable identifiers in the real world. So this was on train cars, and it was read by some sort of analog system that I don't even, that I don't understand, right? The reflections caused photo things to turn and, you know, switches to be, it was like, telephone era electronics. But the desire to put machine readable identifiers on things has been there since the 1950s. It's what drives you know, these giant systems like FedEx, the post office. Um, it's fundamental to the way we live our lives. Um, we interact with machine readable identifiers all the time, every time you check out in the supermarket, etc. But for a variety of reasons, machine-readable identifiers have never actually lived up to the promise of what people have wanted them to do, which is allow them to understand the way in which their systems are actually working in real time in the real world. Um, you end up with a database somewhere. Somebody builds a relational database, and that machine-readable identifier is a pointer into that database, and you can't and if you don't have access to that database, that machine-readable identifier is completely worthless to you. Um, and so everything we buy, you know, the water bottles we have, have barcodes on them. Do we get any value out of those barcodes at all? No, they stop being valuable the minute we left the supermarket. When you're a small company and you start making things, usually what you do is you come up with some sort of stupid, human readable system for um, and human understandable for signifying things. You know, you come up with this idea that you know the first three characters will be the product type, the second three characters will be the lot number, the third th three characters will be the individual serial numbers or some idea like that. Um, but you don't get any tools to actually manage that data from the existing system unless you build your own. So what happens is, is that we track everything with spreadsheets and emails. What Bitcoin looks a lot like is like those, you know, what paper wallets, what Bitcoin addresses actually look a lot like is these machine-readable identifier systems. 
And so the second, the question that we've been, I, the, the, the sort of first observation was that there's this commonality, that there's this idea of um, that Bitcoin addresses are pointers into a, a, this giant ledger, the Bitcoin uh, you know, blockchain ledger, and that you can, from any device, grab that machine-readable identifier and find out uh, what is the state of that item on the ledger. And so I thought that was a really cool property. Um, and actually, in this space, about in August, um, uh, Shriram and I built this thing called Coin Blaster, which was a sweepstakes system based on paper wallets. Um, and that was kind of an inspiration for where we could go next. So, what is this exact problem that we're trying to solve? The world of the supply chain is like a direct to the click graph, and it's filled with adversaries. Your adversaries might be the people who are making your pro a fake version of your product. Uh, I think the people who are buying fake Gucci bags don't really care that they're fake. In fact, they probably are happy about the price that they're getting for something that looks real, but I don't think Gucci is very happy about it. Um, and you are actually facing, Gucci has, has been facing a fairly sophisticated adversary. Frequently, the adversary is their own factories. Um, the biggest source of fake Gucci handbags is Gucci gives you a, a contract to make 10,000 handbags. You make 15,000 handbags and you send, sell 5,000 of them as fake. Pharmaceuticals are even bigger problems. Um, there are fake products, there are diluted products everywhere. Um, the estimate is that in China, fake pharmaceuticals kill 300,000 people a year. Um, and so the problem of how do you solve, uh, how do you create a system in which these things are no longer possible? Um, this is yet another example of how fake, of how fake things work, get into the uh, world. You have, um, you have this uh, you know, military helicopter, um, and you have had all of these Department of Defense reports saying that they cannot stop the flow of fake electronic components into these very expensive pieces of weaponry, um, and it decreases their performance, it causes them to fail, and I think you know, many people have had the experience of, you know, you buy something from Amazon, it looks like the real product, but it doesn't really work that well. Um, and you see, look at the reviews, and the reviews say that this is, you know, it's all five stars, and you're like, why does mine suck? Um, and the reality is, is that every single supply chain faces people who are in the middle of them who have every incentive to introduce fake goods into the supply chain. So this is kind of like a little block diagram of how uh, a modern supply chain works. So uh, you'll have component manufacturers going to product manufacturers, you might go to assemblies, manufacturers, distributors. So it's a multi-party system, and it's, in many cases, none of these are the same company. In fact, if you are the product manufacturer, you might not touch the product that you make at any stage of the process. Um, you will entirely be handled. So like all of this stuff that gets built you know, as a result of Kickstarter projects and stuff like that, that's the modern way of manufacturing things. You go to a company in China, that company in China sources the parts, it assembles the products, it goes to a third party logistics company, that third party logistics company ships it to your customer. You never touch the goods, but you're expected to ensure quality for your customers. Um, so as we've been digging into this, this is what a quality system looks like uh, for managing that you are not getting fake stuff into your supply chain and keeping track of everything for a multi-billion dollar vertically integrated inter into, uh, uh, industry. And for Pfizer, Pfizer owns everything from the factories that make the stuff, to make the drugs, all the way down typically to the trucks that deliver them to pharmacies. Uh, and so they've been able to build this immensely complex system where they have 
uh, server infrastructure that's sitting in the middle. That server infrastructure in the middle talks to everything all over the world. And so no drug can move, nothing gets manufactured without talking to that thing. And that's why you can, why they're able to, to a certain extent, fight the scourge of fake Viagra. Um, and that's more or less what the motivating factor is for why all of this exists, is they were motivated to solve this problem in this incredibly complex, expensive way because they had the government coming down and screaming at them about the fake Viagra. So I think that there's a simpler solution. And that simpler solution is to use the crypto cryptographic uh, uh, framework of the blockchain to actually tag things in the real world. Um, and allow those things then to sort of move through the real world in a way that is natural and doesn't require any massive change in the way business is done. The other thing that I think is really interesting about what the cryptographic principles behind Bitcoin allow you to do is you no longer have to have a separate data layer and a physical layer. So the way in which a big system like that frequently works is that the data that uh, the physical goods move through the system and at certain checkpoints along the way you reconcile what happened in the physical world to what happened in the digital world. Um, and that's frequently a very awkward process. Um, it doesn't happen in real time. And so you have this question of, okay, I typed, I, I finally got this, my drugs, I, typed, I went to the website, I typed in the code, it said that that, that code wasn't found. What does that mean? Um, so what I meant, what the system that I'm proposing <clears throat> is something like this. Alice wants to ship a box to Bob. Wants to ship 100 kilograms or 1,000 kilograms to Bob of widgets. So you put a, a public address on the box. That public address is attached to 100 widgets or 100 kilograms or whatever on the ledger. That item now has a private key inside of it. So now uh, Alice just ships the box to Bob. When Bob gets the box, now Bob, Bob has opens the box, checks the private key. Now he knows a couple of things. If you he could know that this thing came from Alice, because he could look up where this hundred kilograms came from on the ledger. He can he now also has essentially the authority to transform that item on the ledger um, in a completely different way. And one of the things he might want to do with it, and which is common in a supply chain, is he might want to subdivide that box and send it to many other customers. Now those other customers might not trust Bob, uh, but they do trust Alice and they want to know that they've gotten legitimate goods. And so what um, you could do, I think logically to everyone in the room, is you could issue new transactions from the previous transaction, signed with the private key that was in the box, subdividing it, and maintaining that really chaining relationship with the trusted party. So the advantage of a system like this is that it makes life now life very difficult for the bad guys in the middle. Um, what, a bad, what the bad guys in the middle want to do is they want to take this system, they want to, um, uh, uh, what they want to do is they want to, let's say, they got 1,000 kilograms from Alice, they want to have 1,100 kilograms come out. They essentially want to institute something from fake manufacture and integrate it into the supply chain. And that's how, going all the way back, that fake part gets in that giant house. So what are we trying to build? We're trying to build a system. So you start with the cryptographic primitives that underlie Bitcoin. Um, elliptic curve keys, you know, they have the size advantage. Hashes of elliptic curve keys as, um, as identifiers, all good stuff. Um, and realistically, we don't have that many as a as sort of a 
we don't have many, very many cryptographic systems that have ever been truly field tested in the real world. Um, and Bitcoin's cryptographic system is one of them. Then we start, we take that and we build a service that gives you identity and revocations on the, on the, uh, on the deck. So what you have is you have um, a system that can identify a key as belonging to a party and determine whether or not that, that party is trustworthy. So that would be a service that someone could pay for. Um, you can also have revocations of uh, uh, essentially paths through the deck. So if Alice finds out that you know this lot was bad, it failed at uh, uh, some sort of testing that she was doing, she could revoke the whole thing. And then everybody downstream would be able to, who are, who are contacting us and looking at our service, would be able to see that a product has gone, has become, uh, has, that something was wrong, that the product needs to be returned. Um, Building a system for to make it easy to do this at sort of shipping scale and easy to do this in a way. I guess the vision is instead of going out and selling this to large enterprises in a, in a, as, and deeply integrating into their systems, to give something that somebody can order a roll of pop codes off the internet uh, and start putting them on things and immediately get the benefits of the system without having to uh, do anything new, novel, and different from what they do right now. Um, and then, finally, a system for generating a DAG that is verified. So that's probably where you start with the code base of a Bitcoin vendor. Yeah. So I think that this is sort of the I mean, in many ways, this seems like the kind of idea that has been sort of floated and rejected um, in the space of Bitcoin over the last five years. But there are some things that I sort of screw up. I, I think are sort of essential. One is, why aren't the current solutions good enough? The current solutions aren't good enough because the, the sort of complexities that come with having to manage data separately from the credentials to edit that data mean that these systems are slow and unwieldy to use. That when you send goods from one enterprise to another which has a completely different system that probably frequently hasn't been updated since the 1980s, that those systems, uh, uh, that you don't have any way, you don't, you don't access to anybody else's employee database, you don't necessarily understand what is going on inside their enterprise. So having a separation of identifiers and credentials, which is sort of the relational database model of looking at the world, um, has produced these giant unwieldy systems that we find very difficult to kind of fully wrap our heads around. There are more problems than I think just the supply chain that have this shape. Um, I think in a lot of ways, authenticating, distributing resources all have this shape. And if they have this shape, we can use some of the technologies that have sort of come up through the Bitcoin world to make these problems simpler and solve them in a robust way. Um, from what I've been able to figure out just sort of investigating this space, I run into this company called Guard Time, which is an Estonian company. Um, and they are, so they got started in 2007, and all they do is they generate hash trees. They generate hash trees as a service for different companies. Um, and mostly they do it so that you can audit your cloud. And as far as I've been able to tell, they've got $50 million in revenue from hash trees as a service. So being able to structure and store data like this um, is an incredibly powerful business beyond just bounds of what we think about in Bitcoin. So the, the final thing that I, I, I kind of wanted to talk about was that if we can cryptographically verify your system, like what Guard Time does, and we can provide that for all kinds of different business activities, that we can show things that happened and why those things, when those things happen, 
who the parties were involved in uh, cryptographically verifiable, diff uh, difficult to repudiate fashion, um, then what uh, will come, what will be, uh, uh, you'll be able to, you can sort of generally solve kind of a wide range of business problems. So this is kind of like where I got started about four months ago. And what I've sort of experienced since then is that solving the counterfeiting problem is not a, while economically incredibly valuable, is not something that's a good start of business. Um, figured that out fairly fast. But there are some good businesses in here, and the products that we are gonna come out with are gonna be oriented towards more like a system of how do you easily track things? How do you start out with a serialization system when you don't have one? Um, how do you integrate machine readable identifiers into your products when uh, none exist yet? Um, and so that is sort of the basis of our system. Um, and that's what we've been working on. And I hope that will be uh, sort of, it'll turn into a bunch of products soon. So questions? Um, I'm sorry if I missed this, but could you go over again how the physical layer and the data layer really Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So imagine that you, instead of having our system, you have a traditional serial number system. So it means that inside your company, you stick a label or an RFID tag on your product and you ship it to the next person down the line. So that person down the line now can register that they've got that item, but they can't transform it meaningfully. Um, and so what, what we're actually proposing to do is instead of having <clears throat> just sending the identifier, you send the identifier in a private key. And that private key essentially proves that you physically received the package. And that now you can, because you physically received the package, you can manipulate the data that represents that package um, in a way that maintains the chain of trust all the way back to its origin. So is the private key that somehow embedded inside a box? Or yeah. So, you can, so tamper evident packaging has been this sort of like well established thing. The problem has always been that we're relatively good at doing tamper ever evident packaging. We're relatively bad at attaching any sort of identifier to that packaging or putting it in that uh, tamper evident system that can then be sort of moved between enterprises and between companies. So why are you choosing a blockchain to do this instead of like a traditional database? So the, I'm not, so you can build, so the underlying structure that you're trying to capture is a structure where um, you have a set of, so there are maybe three or four different ways of answering that question. So one is you want to have the underlying sort of view of the world that everyone shares be strongly cryptographically verified. So you want a Merkle tree. Now, does that Merkle tree need to be signed by numerous different parties? Does it need to have sort of trustless signatories to it? Probably not. Um, but you can imagine a world where maybe that might have an application. You can imagine a world that it doesn't. Um, the thing that is harder to model inside databases is row by row cryptographic permissions. Um, and that's basically the property that I really want, which is I want the ability to edit that row on the database to be tied to slowly the possession of a private key. Um, and you can implement that on top of a relational database, and you can implement that on top of a variety of other data structures. Um, it's probably a reasonable place to start as a blockchain, and probably not where we're going to end up. Yeah. So what blockchain are you going to so I so where I've been starting coding is with BTCDs, uh, the conformals BTCD library, um, 
that's a relatively easy piece of blockchain implementation of a, of a blockchain that's relatively easy to start modifying and adding in whatever it is that you want. Um, the way in which I've made this secure is I've simply added uh, identity-based signatures to the blocks themselves. So that when you need, uh, when you create a new block, that new block has to be signed by one of a set of parties. So this information like how much products house is sell and sold and how much inventory box is moved to public? So I'm not sure yet what the customer wants. Um, it's relatively easy to, inc to encrypt and obfuscate that data in various ways. Um, my probable intention is that you are going to, we will do some obfuscation of that data, um, but if you have, for instance, um, an identifier, you'll be able to look up um, in a public place, especially to get to the sort of holy grail of the consumer can verify this. Um, you essentially need to be operating in sort of a public uh, uh, sort of namespace, essentially. So this is probably mostly like the warehouse to verify and supply chain to verify the consumer doesn't mm -hmm. No, I think that eventually you get to the consumer verifying. I think the goal should be to build a system in which consumers can do their own verification because in general, the consumer has the most at risk. Um, they're the one who has to put the medicine in their body they're the one who has to use the product. How do you revoke, um, like say that 300 kilograms? So, because assuming you sent it off to somebody else, you sent the price to be off with them. Yes, okay, so when you scan one of these codes, you're actually gonna look for essentially two pieces of information. One is what is the functional equivalent to an unspent transaction output on the blockchain itself. And two, you're going to ask yourself, is this provenance chain intact? Does it uh, begin and continue through trusted parties? So who's going to provide that information? The blockchain can provide you with the idea that this stuff has not been subdivided incorrectly. That, that thousand kilograms didn't turn into a thousand and one kilograms. But you need some sort of additional data layer that tells you that this system, that uh, some sort of additional data layer that tells you um, that this originated through a trusted path. What you can do is you can break that trusted path through on that other system that's essentially functioning like a certificate authority um, at any point along the chain. Um, so if you get, if you, if you trust the origin. The certificate authority trusts the origin, and the origin says that these codes that I issue contain invalid or harmful or recalled items. Then you just break the chain, and so when you scan that, yes, you see that it has 300 kilograms in it. You also know that you can't trust it. Um, it seems like you have two things that need to be secured here. One is the private key, and the other thing is the goods that private key represents. Um, it's still not clear to me how those two things are being secured and how their relationship is being maintained. So that is based, so that's basically the flaw in the system. But the question is, is that flaw significant? So if you have, so how does that manifest? That manifests as um, I'm a middle, I'm, I'm in the middle, I'm a distributor of goods. I've got a, um, somebody, I've, I've gotten from the legitimate manufacturer a thousand widgets. And those thousand widgets are, uh, now I take some of those legitimate widgets and I sell them on the black market and I replace them in the goods with, with the uh, face. Um, at that point, now, you do, you're, you know, you've got fake things that are attested for on the ledger as legitimate. Um, the problem that happens when those things, uh, so the question then becomes, how can you detect them? So on one hand, if you can detect them the conventional way, um, if somebody finds that they, you know, their medicine made them sick, 
their food was didn't contain what they were expecting it to contain. Now they kind of, now you know though, determinist you have a fairly good cryptographic attestation of who the likely fraudulent party is. Because that subdivision step where those new codes were issued. The other thing you could do is you could just simply issue a code twice. You could say you could have two copies of the private key, two copies of the address on two boxes, one of which contains fake stuff, one contains the stuff. And so that depends on the next stage of the chain actually verifying that the goods are legitimate. And the first party to verify will will go fool, and the second party won't. And then you know who is the untrustworthy party in the system. Do you issue a new private key pair, uh, private public key pair, on each transaction, on each yes. step through the supply chain? So it's not the same private key that's being used? No. The idea is that you take possession and you reissue case as, as long as you sort of open and modify the you said the blockchain <coughs> has identity specific like validators. So the blockchain itself doesn't, and it's somewhat. You could do something like uh, so. The the, tr the trade off is if you have a sent if you have a trusted third party that does identity and validation, then that trusted third third party can also maintain confidentiality of who is shipping what to whom and where. If you have some sort of public registry of identities, then you lose confidentiality. Okay. Um, I was wondering about the, like, who's securing the block? So, you can... Miners? Like, I mean, is this a mine? A mine so, or? I wouldn't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have miners secure the blockchain. I don't think that there's, so... So you're gonna offer, like, consensus as a service or something? Yeah, essentially. Like, or just we mine the blocks on the blockchain, or event, or you could have like a trusted set of party. Like, imagine the entire yeah, economy. Something like Hyperledger, right? Where there's no miners, it's just like. Yes, you could use something like Hyperledger. All the validators, there are no untrusted validators, so it's like you don't need all of that overhead security overhead for a proof of work or something like that. Yep. Um, because Hyperledger sort of doesn't exist yet, um, I, the easiest thing to do is just have something that looks like a conventional Bitcoin blockchain and add trusted set of signatures that have to be present in each one. Thought about integrating somehow with some of the 
I mean, I can sort of see the utility for something like Open Bazaar. Um, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> um, because that's, this is exactly the kind of problem that we're trying, that Open Bazaar is trying to solve, which is while Open Bazaar kind of does have its sort of Silk Road aspects to it, um, it's also trying to sort of generally be a general e commerce platform. And one of the challenges that will always be a problem for them is how do you know that the, for any e commerce platform, even the big centralized ones, is how do you know what you are getting is authentic? all the different parties to start using this? That is the problem that I'm trying to solve. <laughs> and of which I have a number of ideas. But it seems like you would have to start at the very back. So if the value prop, so there, there are a bunch of other value propositions that are embedded in this <clears> system. <throat> it's not just the value proposition of um, count and I count. Um, the, if you go back all the way to the notion of machine-readable identifiers, machine-readable identifiers have been appealing to a large number of people for a huge number of things. Um, they've been appealing for tracking velocity, visibility, um, just uh, sort of the current state of your system. Um, and so one of the things that I think a system like what we're proposing can do is it can allow an enterprise without having to invest, invest in a specific set of tools that are specific to their supply chain to start getting the benefits of a machine-readable identifier system without having to build it themselves. Okay. So uh, can you explain one more time what uh, the example of somebody replacing goods with uh, counterfeit goods and the customer receiving those goods. How does this system help them identify who the company, where is the problem occurred? Okay, so, so the risk is at the subdivision step. So if, so if you have um, fraudulent goods introduced into the primary vector in which fraudulent goods are introduced in the system are at, a, uh, are at a step where the goods are transformed or replaced or subdivided. Um, so at that subdivision step, you have a transfer between keys. So you transfer from an incoming set of keys to an outgoing <coughs> set of keys. That outgoing set of keys allows you to, um, so now, you're talking about a system where in those outgoing, a situation where in those outgoing keys, fraudulent goods are discovered. So it's that step, it's the party that was responsible for that step, that transformation from that incoming set of keys to the outgoing set of keys that is the most likely party to have introduced the counterfeit items. So is the assumption that each uh, generation of new key pairs person generating the key pairs is responsible for verifying the, uh, the non-counterfeitness of the goods, the authenticity of the goods. So what you, would also, what you would also find is that if the goods are, uh, so if the goods are, origin, if, if fraudulent goods did not originate with you, if you were not the party that introduced them, you, you will know who the next person above you in the path was. Um, and so what happens in the contemporary supply chain, if it's not all vertically integrated into one company, when fraudulent goods are introduced, there's so many different parties that could be possibly to blame. Um, blame is diffuse, and everybody just lives with the reality. Um, the idea is, is that in this system, responsibility would be constrained to a single path through the tree. Um, and you would more, most likely be able to eventually identify who the malicious party is. Well, so you have like, even like two 
I mean, they would each point the finger at each other, and then you're, you're stuck. So if you have two, and they would each point the finger at each other, it's sort of, a, the, the, the assumption is, is that, uh, so you, you have two parties, <coughs> their relationship is vertical to each other. So one is above, the other one is below. Um, so there is some sort of ultimate source of trust, which is the original manufacturer who you trust. Um, the parties that you move through, those parties then are relaying the trusted goods. And somewhere in that system, there is um, usually to sort of a fan out from each level to, to the next, to the level below them. So the question, so if you are seeing fraudulent goods at one level of the fan out, that would imply that that level of the fan out is where the. You can also spot a path of analysis. As a practical matter, what you've generated is a data trail that people can point to, um, where no data trail exists today. How often does this sort of fraud happen? So, the how often does this sort of fraud happen? So, if you're in the United States, depending on what you're using, it, well, so we encounter this kind of fraud all the time. Um, in our lives, in products that don't work as they're supposed to, as things that are mislabeled or um, uh, uh, where something that is of higher cost is, introduced, is sold, as, or something that is lower cost is sold as thing that's uh, higher cost. You might encounter this problem in the uh, supermarket. You may or may not encounter this problem in a uh, you know, hospital or a pharmacy. Isn't that primarily caused by dilution and not replacement in kind? So, both. Um, so dilution is something that the system does an extremely good job of. Uh, because the way in which dilution works is you have some trusted party, it has trusted inputs, so you know that they're getting uh, drugs from a trust, from the pharmaceutical company, and um, you trust the outputs. But because the quantities of the inputs are not related to the quantities of the out outputs in most systems that exist today, you have an incredible incentive to dilute, to produce more output than you had in. You, you actually had a number in, in your slide, it said 5% of like whatever that was, a yes. trillion dollar pharmaceutical global market or something, right? So, yeah, so like, the reality is, is that we encounter this problem in our lives here. If you live in a society of weaker institutions and uh, less uh, uh, sort of um, powerful state forces to police these systems, then you encounter these problems in a far more serious way. Um, 20 to 30 percent of drugs in India, 20 to 30 percent of drugs in China, fake, um, fake goods and services. Um, you have, and then periodically you have these scandals. Like you have the milk powder scandal in China, where uh, you get uh, fake poisonous milk powder is found to be throughout the entire food supply uh, chain, and basically people panic and start importing Western stuff from outside of the country. When something like that happens with a system like this, of course people just pour it and and try to find commonalities. So, this yes. Analyzed, they possibly discover the culprit that way. Yeah. You would find the culprit relatively quickly because you would know who was diluting there. Right. Sort of similar like when a crowd set or something. Could it be that this would foster speedy delivery as well? Because you could imagine maybe a sort of a Uber or Lyft kind of service which would handle delivery at a certain size? So not so there's there's a couple of places in which this is sort of a relevant concept. One is you so this goes back to the need, why, what are the benefits of machine readable identifiers just generally? So you are you know, you run your Kickstarter campaign, you develop a product, you have all of these third parties that are moving your goods around for you. And as you move them around, 
um, you don't actually have a great deal of insight into what the velocity is or how quickly your customers are getting satisfied. Uh, you might just get emails, and you're going to be spending day in and day out tracking uh, uh, that reality. Um, a system of easy to use machine readable identifiers solves that problem for you. Um, and then you can imagine a society where more sophisticated services are built on top of this. Do you see the incentive growing on the network side of it's the so you see the cops. You see the cops as like being incentivized party or the I mean basically the bankers. You know. So I think the way that a system like this gets into the world is on incentivizing speed, and I think the way it sort of becomes a permanent part of the way in which the world works is through the fraud thing. There's also a cost thing. Probably doesn't have to make one of those. In yeah. Order to yell benefits. They yeah, one of these costs $500 million. And you don't have to include those costs in the product. Do you think going, going after a vertically integrated supply chain first would make more sense since you don't have to kind of get a bunch of different parties on the same page? You can just get one big party to kind of try it out on their vertical supply chain and see how that goes? So there have been a couple of similar ideas people have basically done GUIDs as a service, um, that where they've sort of done that, mostly in the agricultural product space. Um, I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> so if you go to uh, if you go to Pfizer with this idea, and Pfizer is like, wow, this is a brilliant idea. We totally want to do it. Uh, why do they why wouldn't they just do it themselves since they have that 500 million to spend on this other force of system? I mean, they could, but I mean, so the question is, is why won't people just copy this system? Um, and I think largely people will eventually. I think this is, I think this is an elegant enough solution to a problem that has been, that, that systems have struggled with and that once something like this gets out into the world, people will start building systems like this. Um, I think that as a company, you can build a fairly nice competitive mode around your technology. Um, and, but eventually this will be how things, data is managed across large physical systems. Isn't there a network effect aspect? It's, it's better if you're on the same system as your vendors and suppliers. Yep. There is a network effect system. There's advantages to everybody being relying on common systems of trust. Yeah, I mean, the revoking thing has had the same CA. Yes. So if you type a given vertical through the system, you need to use a common system. Um, whether or not that vertical is you own everything and therefore everybody uses a common system, or everybody is trying to figure out how to compete in this marketplace, and finds a common system that they can all use. Did you envision your effort going out two, three years? No, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry guys, we, um, yeah. we're really on our time here. Oh, these questions are awesome, but um, uh, Saki, I apologize.